Let's talk about the brain this week. And I'd like to start us off by going over some major ge geographic regions. Here we have the anterior or the front side. This is the posterior or the back side. How do we know this is posterior? This structure right here, which is called the cerebellum. Cerebellum actually means little brain, and that is on the posterior side. So how do we know left, right? If we were to look at the brain like so, you'd notice that we have this very long, deep groove. That is called the longitudinal fissure. It runs along the length of the brain, and it is a very deep groove. That's what fissure means. And that longitudinal fissure is what creates the two cerebral hemispheres, meaning the left and the right sides of the brain. So if we're putting those clues together, we said this is anterior, this is posterior. So now we're looking at the back of someone's brain, and you know that this creates the two hemispheres, the two halves. Then you would say for sure, this is the right side of the brain or the right cerebral hemisphere, and this therefore is the left side or the left cerebral hemisphere. It's important we know these grooves because they give us the borders between the uh, different lobes of the brain. So whereas that longitudinal fissure tells us the left from the right cerebral hemispheres, other grooves such as the central sulcus right here, by the way, sulcus means shallow groove. So a fissure is a very deep groove, goes far down in there. A sulcus is a much more shallow groove. We saw those terms last week when we were looking at the spinal cord. And another memory trick I like to use is S for sulcus, S for shallow. This central sulcus right here is the divider between the frontal and parietal lobes. So you see how this line creates the border between those two lobes? Again, we have one on the left side as well. There's that central sulcus. So this would be the left frontal lobe, the left parietal lobe. Back here, again, the right frontal lobe, right parietal lobe. We have another groove right here, and this is called the lateral sulcus. Now I will say, I have read um, pieces of literature that have this listed as a lateral fissure, um, but in our materials, we refer to this as the lateral sulcus. And, begin, and again, because we have two hemispheres, we would label this as the right lateral sulcus. Therefore, this one is the left lateral sulcus. So what does this create um, the border between? This creates the border between the temporal and parietal lobes. And then finally right here, we have the right and left occipital lobes. They are in the occipital region or the occiput. Let's focus in on that central sulcus. I really like this model because it's color coded and it um, really singles uh, these two gyri out right here. So um, here we have the central sulcus on the left cerebral hemisphere. This is the central sulcus on the right cerebral hemisphere. Recall that when we are looking at that central sulcus, we use the term pre-central and post-central to describe the gyri on either side. So remember the directional terms kind of go from anterior to posterior. So if this is before the central sulcus, we would call this the pre-central gyrus. And because this raised portion or gyrus comes after the central sulcus, we call that the post-central gyrus. So big whoop, what does that mean? Well, these two parts of the cerebral cortex, re remember the cerebral cortex just makes up the surface, like all the wrinkly parts of the brain, are responsible for sensory and motor functions. If I were to tilt the model like this, you could see that the pre-central gyrus is also known as the motor cortex. Always pause when you see new terminology and just think, okay, what does motor imply? Movement. So what we're saying here is that when you look at the distribution of these body parts right here, right here, we're saying that 
this part of the cerebral cortex is responsible for um, relaying the signals for movement at these parts of the body. So the precentral gyrus is also known as the motor cortex. The postcentral gyrus is known as the sensory cortex. So if I were just to flip this around, you can see we have different parts of the cerebral cortex that are responsible for um, uh, receiving sensory information from these parts of the body. There's a very interesting figure that you'll see in many textbooks and it's called the homunculus. And the homunculus, there's a motor homunculus and a sensory homunculus. It is an image of a distorted person that is proportional to how much of the cortex is responsible for um, controlling that part of the body or receiving information from that part of the body as you can see right here in this image. Um, so just to summarize, that precentral gyrus or um, the precentral cortex or the motor cortex is responsible for creating that voluntary skeletal muscle action. And then the sensory cortex or the uh, postcentral cortex is responsible for receiving sensory information from that part of the body. Something that's kind of interesting is that it is contralateral, meaning that the motor cortex in the right hemisphere actually controls the skeletal muscles on the left side of the body. And likewise, the uh, motor cortex on the left hemisphere controls the skeletal muscles on the right side of the body. All right, here we have a mid-sagittal view of the brain. This is the right cerebral hemisphere. And when we have it in this view, we can see just how far down that longitudinal fissure goes. So what holds the brain together? That would be this uh, white matter right here called the corpus callosum. There's one on either side of the brain and the corpus callosum is also responsible for um, transmitting uh, information to either side of the brain. Then we have the diencephalon, which is this area right here. The diencephalon is also referred to as the in-between brain because it's sandwiched between the two cerebral hemispheres. And it is made up of the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. So let's look more closely at those areas. Zoomed in here within the um, Diencephalon, we have the epithalamus. And for my students, the only thing that you need to know about the epithalamus is this specific structure called the pineal gland. And that is this part right here at the tip of my blunt probe. There are some other structures here, but on this model, I would say the pineal gland is the only thing that they're really showing here. I've pulled out this model because I think it shows it a little bit better. Um, this right here is what where the pineal gland would be. Recall that the pineal gland is an endocrine organ. It produces and secretes melatonin, which helps regulate our circadian rhythms. Um, the other part of the epithalamus, if you're just looking at this in the book, is something called the habenular nucleus. That's this over here. It's not in your lab manual for my students, um, but that is technically part of the epithalamus. This part right here is something called the posterior commissure. Um, again, that's not something my students have to know. So I would say this part right here, that's what you need to be able to identify as being the pineal gland. The next one I want to talk about is the thalamus. And the thalamus is this body right here. In fact, we're only seeing the right side of the thalamus. The thalamus for the left side would come out over here. It's kind of this oval shaped structure um, and it's connected by, this thing right here is called the interthalamic adhesion. That just connects the right um, part of the thalamus to the left side, which would be in the left cerebral hemisphere. And then last but certainly not least for the diencephalon, we have the hypothalamus, hypo meaning below, so you can think it's below the thalamus. Here, this is where the hypothalamus would be. The hypothalamus is a very important part of the brain because it serves as um, the kind of master of both the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. Um, 
the hypothalamus will connect to the pituitary gland, as we see on this model right here, via the infundibulum stalk. Let's now zoom in on the midbrain, or just parts of the midbrain. The midbrain is also known as the mesencephalon, so tie that back to what we looked at as far as the embryologic and fetal development of the brain. Midbrain, mesencephalon, I kind of think M for mesencephalon, M for middle or midbrain. And the midbrain is going to be this area right here. If I were to show that on this model, it's this area right there. The first structure I want to point out are these things called cerebral peduncles. And the cerebral peduncles are located in this area right here. Same right here. On these models, you know, we don't go into a ton of detail on these models. So for my students, you're mostly just understanding the areas. So the cerebral peduncles are here and here. And then if we were to go caudally, so remember anterior, posterior, but a lot of times when we're talking about the brain, we'll use the terms rostral and caudal. Rostral means towards the nose, caudal means towards the tail, um, but anterior, posterior, rostral, caudal, just in case you're reading other resources or looking at other resources and you're like, why in the world are they using those names? Those are commonly used, especially when we're talking about the brain. So if we were to go posteriorly, posteriorly, we would come to these two little bumps right here. Okay, on this model, those two little bumps are right here. And those two little bumps are referred to as the tectal plate or the corpora quadrigemina, which is a big word, but it is not a word that you need to be afraid of because I think corpora kind of reminds us of body quad. Quad means what? four. So for what? Let's think about this. We have two bumps here. And how this actually exists in situ, remember we're only looking at a half of the brain, but there are two pairs of structures called colliculi. We have a pair of superior colliculi and a pair of inferior colliculi. I'm going into more detail than what my students need to know, but I like to explain this because it helps make this make a lot more sense. Because we're only looking at one half of the brain, we only see the one of the top pair and one of the bottom pair. Those colliculi are responsible for visual and auditory sensations. So that superior, this is where we have some visual input and the um, uh, inferior is gonna be auditory. But together, if we had both halves together, you could see we would have two top and two bottom. Two plus two is four. So that's where quadrigemina comes from. Also in that area of the midbrain, we have this tunnel here called the cerebral aqueduct. And we'll talk about this a lot more when we go over cerebrospinal fluid production and flow. Continuing on, we have a structure called the pons. So this um, little kind of circular region right here and right here is called the pons. And the pons is going to be one of the areas where we have um, respiratory control. And a way that I like to tell, teach students how to remember the location of this is recall that a moment ago we said these are the cerebral peduncles, this area right here. Cerebral peduncle, or peduncle I should say, means little foot. So cerebral peduncle, if you wanna translate it, kind of means little feet in the brain. Pons translates to bridge. So the little feet are standing on top of the bridge. The cerebral peduncles are standing on top of the pons. Here, inferior to that, we have the medulla oblongata, or medullae oblongata, or medulla oblongata, or medulla oblongata. I have heard so many pronunciations of this. So however you wanna pronounce it, I guess, as long as it's a common pronunciation and you know how to spell it correctly, that is this area right here. And the medulla oblongata is a very important part because it connects everything up here 
to the spinal cord. If we were to continue onwards inferiorly like this, this will very quickly become the spinal cord. And now we have bridged what we looked at um, last time within the spinal cord to what we're doing this week within the brain. And then here we have the cerebellum, which means little brain. It is on the posterior or um, caudal side of the brain. Um, it is responsible for kind of fine tuning our skeletal muscle movements and then also receiving proprioceptive information, which is involved in maintaining our posture and balance. It is composed of two cerebellar hemispheres, so different from cerebral hemisphere, so cere cerebellar hemisphere, so this would be the right side, um, and this uh, structure called the vermis, which means worm, ew, I think that's kind of yucky sounding, but whatever, um, that's what se separates the two cerebellar hemispheres. And then we have anterior and posterior lobes. That's a bit more detailed than what my students have to go into, but that is how the cerebellum is divided. And on the inside here, we have a beautiful arrangement of white matter called the arbor vitae. Um, arbor refers to tree-like, and if you look here, it looks like a beautiful little tree. So make sure that you can distinguish um, the arbor vitae from the other structures.